<coughs> David Doe, welcome to Select Committee. Uh, I don't know if you're in this morning where you've seen the format, but basically we have five minutes together. Yep. It's an opportunity for you to tell us what, what we need to know. Okay. Uh, if we have time, if you're able to leave some time at the end for questions, well, well good, that would be a good thing. But otherwise, the time is very much yours. So, right. please. Uh, so, you um, so I hitchhiked from Hamilton to be here today because of what this means to me and the people that I love in my life. Um, I don't want to have to wait for, um, to see people get the, the care that they need. Um, when I was 20, I spontaneously developed uh, temporal lobe epilepsy, causing me to have seizures that last for up to 40 minutes. Um, I've tried six different medications, um, two of which I'm still currently taking, um, making day-to-day -day life not very enjoyable, if I'm honest. Um, cannabis helps me in a way that nothing else can. Um, it removes a lot of the side effects of the medication that they have me taking, and I feel like it helps me in my day-to-day -day life as well. Um, you know, I, I see people going to jail for, for things to do with um, marijuana and stuff like that and, you know, people supplying and stuff like that. Some people are in it for money and other people are more so about people. Um, I just think that we're behind in times as opposed to other countries when it comes to the, the medical care. And every night before I go to sleep, the last thing I think about is, am I going to wake up here or in hospital? But it's the fear that I have every night. It's um, damaged my childhood memory. I don't remember anything. I don't even recall the birth of my own child, which obviously would mean a lot to me, those sort of moments. Um, but I'd like to be able to get the, the health care that we need so that I have a chance to create new memories that I'm not going to lose, um, you know, times that I can have with my daughter and that I don't have to go to bed every night worrying so much. Um, you know, with, with my lack of funding and stuff like that, I have to go through black market. You know, it's the only way to get what I need, and I'm not allowed to do this because someone says I can't. There's no justification in that. That person hasn't lived a day in my shoes or in, in the shoes of anyone else that's here supporting this today. Um, it's just, it's almost immoral to, to have it illegal, you know? Um, oh, it's just, it's hard um, because I lived most of my life so, you know, so normal. Um, the pieces that I remember were normal, and I just want to be able to go back to living a day-to-day -day life and, and so that, you know, I, I look forward to tomorrow rather than worrying about where I'm going to be. David, thank you. I'm just joining the dots here, and your submission uh, sort of fills it out, but you clearly received benefit from cannabis. That's what you're telling me. Yep, very much so. Um, the medication gives me side effects like uh, tremors, loss of appetite, insomnia, all things like that, and every single one of those things that I feel is treated by cannabis. Obviously, smoked. I can't get it in any other way. Um, I'm not a very good cook, so, um, yeah. But uh, it, it helps me immensely, and I'm not just here for me. I'm here for people all around the country. There's people well worse off than me suffering from things on a way worse level, and they can't get the, the care and the help that they need either. I mean, you've made a real effort to uh, be here today and you, you've, you've spoken wonderfully uh, straight from person to people. So uh, we will carry your voice. We will try and do the best we can to remember and, and understand what you've told us. So thank you for making such an effort to be here today. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good. Uh, let's go to DS teleconference if we can. <coughs> Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, hello. This is Dr. Shane Reddy speaking, Deputy Chair of the Health Select Committee. Around the uh, table today we have MPs Matt Ducey, Angie Warren-Clark and Dr. Liz Craig. 
Thank you very much for joining us. We've put aside five minutes to, to understand and to listen to what you have to say to us. And you should take it as read that we have read your submission. So, again, we, we're in your hands. Um, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I'd just like to voice my opinion on the misuse of Grace Act amendment. I support the proposed amendment, Section 2 of this Act, but an exception needs to be extended to include chronic pain suffering. Chronic pain is a terminal disease. Um, I'm a 54-year-old woman suffering from pain for 14 years and I live alone. I spend winter mostly in bed. Twelve months ago, in autumn, I was stricken with pain and contracted pneumonia. Due to the inability to be mobile and look after myself, I was sick for four and a half months, unable to do daily charge. Due to a previous unhealthy lifestyle, I have succumbed to permanent injuries to my back and neck. These including my knees are riddled with osteoarthritis. Some life events have scarred my nervous system, causing post-traumatic stress disorder and fibromyalgia relating to severe trauma. There is no cure for fibromyalgia and no effective medication. The side effects from tramadol, which, I, which is an addictive opiate, which I took for over five years, and nortriptyline, a pain blocking <coughs> included confusion, lethargy, depression, which I've struggled for for many years, and also hard on my already challenged liver. I now have been off all medication for 18 months. I've discovered the benefit of eating cannabis recently, and my life has dramatically changed for the better. <coughs> I have quality of life and I get chores done with ease and motivation. I eat well <coughs> now. I sleep well. Pain doesn't interfere with my sleep and two years of depression is gone. Maybe I can get a job one day. I have seen for myself how CBD gradually gets an epileptic seizures as well. So I reiterate, this bill needs to be extended to include chronic pain and suffering. We need to be able to grow our own medicine. Medicinal cannabis is the only treatment that works for fibromyalgia. Chronic pain is a terminal disease. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a moment. Uh, Angie, Liz, do you have any questions? No, Matt, do you have any questions? No. no, look, this has been a very thoughtful submission. Um, we've read what uh, you've written to us. We've taken on board that extension of the exception and the scope to chronic pain, and we'll weave that into our deliberations. So thank you very much for speaking with us this morning. Oh, thank you for listening. Good day. Thank you. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. You too. Good. Is Dr. David Porter in the room? Hello, David. Would you like to come up, please? <coughs> David, uh, you've seen the format. Um, we have uh, five minutes together and, and some questions, hopefully, at the end, if you're, if you're able to make space. But fundamentally, this time is yours to tell us what we need to know. So welcome, David. Please go ahead. Thank you. I would hope that most of that time uh, would be for questions from you to me. Um, in fact, the last submitter it could not have done a better job of summarising what I hear from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patients in my practice. So I'm a rheumatologist, and by nature I see a lot of chronic pain. Roughly 75% of that will be due to diseases where the immune system malfunctions and causes inflammation within some body system, often the joints, which is why rheumatologists are associated with arthritis, but often... Uh, all around the body as well. And I, 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 plucking a figure out of the sky, I think about 75% of my patient load would be that. And I think they, in general, are exceptionally well served by Western medicine and conventional medicine. I think the tools that I've got in that side of my job are really good. I have no idea whether CBD is good for that side, as, but, but I'm not particularly interested because I have a lot of options. However, that leaves about 25% of patients who are exactly like the lady that just talked. They, they, are, they are exhausted, 
They are in chronic pain all day. Their brains don't work properly. They can't do find simple words. They can't do simple calculations. And they're extremely disabled by a problem that is invisible to the outside world. So 5% of the female population, or perhaps 5%, walking around the streets of Wellington today have an existence like that. They look well, and they are constantly frustrated by the fact that they look well, but they feel goddamn awful in just about every, every respect. And... The tools that I have available to me for that, amitriptyline as you mentioned, nortriptyline as you mentioned, we can go into codeine and then up, up the opioid scale, which nobody wants to do. I would estimate about 10% of patients do pretty well on, on any one of those agents, but when I write a prescription for it and I hand it across the table, my heart literally sinks. I think I'm almost certainly going to, the odds of me doing you harm with this are far greater than the odds of me doing you good with this. And nothing I have <coughs> learnt about uh, medicinal cannabis at all came from medical school or continues to come from the medical profession, although that's very slightly changing. The, the awareness is growing, and I think things will explode uh, in the conventional medical world. But everything I've learnt is off patients, really, and by extension, uh, they have brought me into contact with people who supply them because they can't find a supply anywhere else. And... And that woman's testimony is, is what I hear from hundreds and hundreds of patients. Everything else makes me feel worse. This thing has never given me a side effect. I, I quite literally can look you in the eye and say I have not had a single patient in my whole practicing career who has complained of a CBD-related side effect. It's absolutely unique in that respect. And I have been staggered by the number of patients and more particularly just like her, that some of the individuals that have been profoundly helped by this medication, absolutely life-changing, I would have thought were utterly unfixable. Um, and and, and that, that impression just gets reinforced every day of my working practice. And I probably don't have much more to say than that. I, 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 I think it's... I, I think that... Regarding it as a drug is almost erroneous. So I think it should be thought about in, in people's heads as the equivalent of greenlit mussels, fish oil, turmeric. I think it, it, it's, it, it almost to me is a, is a nutritional supplement that happens to be damn good at what it does for a lot of patients. My guess is 10% failures. This is from patient feedback. It just doesn't work for them. 10% miracles where I would have thought completely unfixable people have had their lives transformed, and most people are somewhere in between. But so importantly, never a side effect. David, you've talked about the CBD. Uh, do you have any experience with THC? Um, you've been in, your <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in your clinical practice. I went to university, but I didn't inhale. <laughs> yes, Mr. Clinton, um, keep going. <laughs> I do, <laughs> and I... So we'll generally thank you for that, but we'll generally just stay in committee yeah. questioning. Um, there, I have a range of patients who have a range of suppliers who, for the most part, in my practice, and I've, I've steered them very specifically towards the low THC products. Not because I don't believe in THC, but because a lot of my women are in their seventh, you know, they're, they're largely women. I, I just, it, it, I think THC has a really important role to play but I don't know quite where that fits in. I think get the first thing through the door first. Right. We have time for another question. Uh, Angie, do you have a question? Liz? Um, well, well, just, just one, one comment. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the major problems in people's lives who have fibromyalgia and chronic pain is that they can't sleep. And, and many doctors, think, you know, the, the, the academics in the field might feel that that may be the actual fundamental problem. And... Again, feedback from patients, I think THC is really, that's its main role that I've observed. It, 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 people, somebody behind me gave, gave one of these un, incurable ladies uh, some brownie. Purposely has a little bit of THC in it. Mm -hmm. She came back after a weekend, I think she got it on a Thursday. She came back with tears rolling down her cheeks on the Monday. And I'm about to burst into tears thinking of her. I've slept for the first time in three decades. 
and that's utterly profound, you know, it, it, and it makes such a difference to them. The last question, Ms. Craig. <laughs> I think it's, it's clearly it's miles behind. My, my superficial understanding is that because medical research was specifically blocked in the US in particular for so long, things are rapidly catching up. So, so the people in the field know things, and they've known things for years. And, and I think seizure disorders, childhood seizure disorders in particular, are the biggest example of that. And this year there's been big papers in the New England Journal and the Lancet unequivocally saying that this is a, a, a quite fantastic addition the armamentarianism, and I think I think the conventional medicine will actually explode. Um, it'll come on board very quickly. But the other thing, it, it's incredibly conservative. You know, I, I work in Nelson. I think we're a fairly open-minded community in general. Um, I spoke to my physician colleagues at the hospital there just about about just what I've told you, and the resistance I got was and remains completely baffling to me. A group of people who are trained to weigh evidence, look at evidence. It's like, drugs are bad, marijuana is bad. I'm not even going to listen. But I think that all changed fast. David, you've uh, travelled from Nelson and you've certainly brought a lens onto this discussion that's been very, very useful. So thank you very much today. Thank you. <coughs> we have Lisa Sullivan. Hello, Lisa. Hiya. Come on up to the table. Good afternoon, Lisa. Uh, Hi. Thank, Hi. Yeah. Thank, thank you for joining us. You've seen the format of how we do things in committee. I'm really uh, sorry if it's too long to cut me off. Oh, no, we'll, 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 be, we'll be polite. Not at all. We're here yeah, to listen. My story's really emotional, so we're, I really need to tell you. We're here to listen. You tell us what we need to know. Please go ahead. Does that work? Close the access to tissues? No, I'm not going to cry. Yes, the microphone okay. does work. If I cry, that's it. I'm done. Is that all right? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so my name is Lisa Sullivan, and I'm here in front of you because I want you to see the reality of the individual lives you're holding in your hands, and your decisions following this select committee could make our lives easier or much harder, perhaps even deadly, and no dramatics are any intended there. You see me as just another submitter, but I'm not a number or a statistic. I'm a law-abiding citizen, that girl from small town New Zealand, who worked hard and gave back to others constantly. I raised my son alone since he was two. Was Always worked and studied. And whilst battling ill health, I earned two degrees. My proudest and hardest achievement was going back to nursing school at, and graduating at age 37. And I only got to work three years post-grad in the job I loved. I was trained to work in the institution, the chains that now bind me as a patient and are so very horrible to chronic illness. I don't want to treat especially pain patients. They see us as they can dehumanise us. It's fine. Anyway, you see I'm now disabled, completely unable to work in the career I loved and worked so hard for, and sometimes a lot. I feel a burden on everyone. I believe my rights as a New Zealand citizen are being breached every day under the Human Rights Act, allowing me to live a fulfilling and productive life as a disabled person. The code of rights is being broken every day that I have contact with my professionals by providing me the one thing that would make my life bearable, being reasonable pain relief. You see, I have an incurable genetic connective tissue disease called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which brings along with it a laundry list of comorbidities, <laughs> including but not limited to postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or osteoarthritis, brittle asthma, life-threatening allergies, uh, primary immunodeficiency syndrome, gastroparesis, which is a paralysed tummy. I have a portica inserted in my chest as I have no venous access. I would die if I didn't have that. Um, I've had 40-odd surgeries in the last 10 years, and I'm still disabled. 
Ellis Danlos is caused by a fault in my DNA, which means my collagen is deranged and doesn't hold my body together. It's the largest protein in the body, you guys know that. Um, it comprises 80% of our structure inside and out. I suffer all the above comorbidities, but the awful part, awful part of it is, is dislocating my joints, any joint. There's 360 of them in any one of them, hundreds of times a day. I suffer from tears and ruptures surgery cannot fix. The scariest part is not even the dislocations or the pain. It's the failure of internal organs, which I live with. A ticking time bomb in terms of my heart, my lung, my arteries. They could dissect at any moment. This is invisible to you and everyone else, but please for one moment, can you imagine what it's like to have a condition that's invisible, incredibly painful and deadly? Will I be the lucky one that won't suffer a major rupture or will I stay the same as I am now? One thing we do know is EDS is degenerative and my issue is no cure, pills or surgeries will change this. Treating the chronic and acute pain that I have is the only thing that will make my life more comfortable. I have 15 consultants that I see regularly, and they only deal with one body part each. People have no idea what chronic pain is actually like till they suffer it, and they think that we don't deserve medication. It's infuriating. I guarantee that people would change their opinion if they experience one day of what I go through, or we go. I'd give anything to have the social life of a 40-year-old, not a 90-year-old. <laughs> why changing the laws around compassionate care and extending access to medical cannabis is why I'm putting myself through this stress. Because I gave birth to my son 20 years ago with no diagnosis to make informed genetic decisions. You see, EDS is autosomal dominant, and it's passed through any parent. I didn't know I had it, and it's a 50% chance regardless. Um, I thought my son had escaped the bullet, but it appears likely not. And he has already had to reevaluate his career choice for the future because he won't be able to do it physically. Can you tell a 20 year old that pain without end and destined to get worse is okay? I'm doing this for me and all my fellow chronic patients, but my boy's future too. Cannabis and hemp products have had millions of studies and investment put in them, and the medicinal effects can't be denied. Labor's promises on the campaign trail said that people like me would get access to medicinal cannabis. However, this has been completely watered down to terminal only. And yeah. What about those of us that linger on with levels of pain that most have never experienced? Is that acceptable? My GP has told me I'm at my upper limit of opiates now. I'm on oxynorm and oxycontin, that, and have been for six years. They barely work. No, barely work. <coughs> and he told me to try cannabis. Shocked me, because he's really, really um, against drugs. <laughs> he shocked me. But, you know, my only choice is black market, and I don't live in those circles. I literally am at a loss as to how I'm supposed to do this. I don't want to break the law. I don't want to be arrested. I can't imagine what would happen if I was to be in prison. I worked in a prison as a nurse. I know what it's like. The current law allows certain patients to obtain legal CBD and certificates. These products are for the rich only. And the rich don't need them. I propose broadening the defence, the statutory defence for chronic pain also, allowing medicinal cannabis patients, maybe a card system like, like Colorado and California, to grow their own for their own personal use, not to sell it. Uh, but if they don't want to do that, the sort of ability like California and Colorado with the stores that sell a variety of products. My EDS friends overseas who have access to medicinal cannabis have been able to cut their opiate use completely or to a very, very low effect, which means it works amazingly when they use it. Where will this end for me? I have lost approximately one Ellis Danlos friend every month for the last four years to either EDS complications or suicide because the pain was too much to bear. Is this what will be my future? Thank you. Lisa, this was an excellent presentation. Um, very much from you to us. Uh, we've learned a lot. Can I just add that to have a child with Ulus Danlos? Hey, hey buddy.
pregnancy and Ulos Danos. Pregnancy and Ulos Danos is incredibly yeah, challenging. That's where my turning point was. Too. Incredibly complicated. So if there's any sort of brightness on the horizon, you have a child. But we understand your other challenges, and you're here asking us to help you with these other challenges, more specifically that and cannabis I'm worried about products his future too. It, it would improve your your outcome, your outlook, your quality of life. Yeah, I, I can only get out of bed because of taking an oxynorm and put my joints all back in that have popped out through the night. Wow. And that's not a joke. Plus the six times I get up through the night, I have to make sure my legs are enough in the joint so I can walk to the toilet or limp to the toilet. Some days I can't need to use my chair, power chair. And I go from bed to couch and wait for my caregiver to come and give me a shower. That's my day. I'm 47 years old with two degrees and I'm dumb now. And you're telling us that cannabis and medicinal products would help well, that? Well, I, I really hope I have not got a great experience of it. I mean, I haven't got a lot of experience because, as I say, I have not lived in those circles. I don't know where to get it. I've tried it once and a friend of a friend got it for me because she was so upset about me coming out of hospital. I'd had a cast on my leg for one year trying to repair three ripped tendons on my ankle. Of course, they wouldn't repair. <laughs> and he just took the cast off and left me like that to walk out of the hospital. I had two five milligram oxygen tablets in a 24-hour period, unable to me. I just sat in the car and said to her, what am I going to do? And she said, let's try Let's see what we can do. We well, felt like criminals standing on the deck trying to roll this thing. We didn't even know how to roll one. You know, like, I took three puffs that day, and she said, that's enough, because she's a psych nurse, and put it in a glass jar. And she said, just lie down and see how you do. I'll watch you. And I fell asleep. I don't daytime nap at all, because I can't. I just try and take my mind off things by Facebook and stuff. I fell asleep for about three quarters of an hour and she watched me. And when I woke, she said to me, how do you feel? And I did a, like a body check and went, actually can't pinpoint one joy that actually is hurting me right this minute. Like the doctor said about sleep being the biggest thing. Same for me, I've been insomniac since I was, mum tells me, a little child. And... Um, it got worse at 13 when, like most women, it, it's a hormone-related thing. Everything else kicked and then asthma came. All the allergies started. Yeah, so I haven't slept well for a long time and um, just gave up on any, any hope of that because my doctor doesn't want to give anything and I understand, I understand the addiction of sleeping pills and they're not counterproductive, etc. But you can't tell me to take a glass of milk and that's going to change everything, you know. It doesn't. I throw up bile from reflux, you know. I wake up choking if I don't wake up to throw a joint back in thinking it's a nightmare. It's not. We've it's a been, living hell. We've taken on board that uh, you'd like this as an option to be able to safely explore and um, we have taken that on board and we'll certainly do our best to, again, weave in your story into it into our deliberations. Thank you very much. You did really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good. Kelly Whitey. Very good. Kelly Bruce Prescott on the teleconference.
Hello, Mr. Prescott, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, good, thanks, Mr. Prescott. This is Dr. Shane Reedy speaking, Deputy Chair of the Health Select Committee. Around the table this afternoon are fellow MPs Matt Ducey, Angie Warren-Clark and Liz Craig. We have read your submission and thank you very much for sending it in. We have time with you here today, roughly five minutes. Uh, if you wanted to leave any time for questions afterwards, that would be great, but fundamentally the time's yours. Please go ahead. Um, Really, the convention is that, sorry, the convention is that we're here to listen. Tell us what we don't know. Tell us parts of the bill that we could make better, that isn't working for you, that is working for you. We're here to form and bring together all the, the information that we can and try and chart a way forward. Oh, okay. Um, well, um, my opinion on my board was voting back, and I've been on that for three years off and on with the back injury. Um, nearly ended my existence about a year ago from the face of it. And I just think that if you're trying to regulate who's growing um, for what, um, it's like telling people that they can't grow their vegetables or their flowers. Um, marijuana should be left as, you know, you can wipe like, body and grow just so many plants per person. Um, and just leave, um, like you can't believe it, like, um, Obviously, you've all been trying with government in place for a long, long time, and all the things costing the road, you know, the taxpayers a whole lot of money. Um, whereas, if you went to the medical side of it and had um, control of that way, like um, who's making, um, you know, the marijuana products on the health benefits, you know, and for food and, and all that sort of thing. So, and I'm actually at the moment trying to get a, a license to grow it myself. But, um, you know, it's just a slow process and I don't think anything's going to happen in time to um, But, yeah, really, uh, mate, to be honest, this prohibition hasn't worked, never has. And uh, I think you guys, you know, hopefully you guys are going to make a decision about it and, and please don't sit on your hands and think that's quite a right like it is because millions of Kiwis just did otherwise, time and time again, and I think it's about time for a change. Good, thank you, Bruce. Uh, <coughs> we'll uh, make our way around the table, see if we have any questions. Uh, Matt, do something? Yep. Um, How are you? Go ahead if yep. you have a Thanks, thanks, Bruce. Um, so basically, if I understand you right, you. You're advocating for a regime that would allow people to grow their own versus uh, uh, a highly regulated model where you would need to uh, maybe get a licence and, and uh, buy uh, or, or be prescribed through a medical process? Um, I think there's, there's definitely be a cause for that. But for Joe Bloggs, who, who doesn't want to drink... Um, and just wants to relax at night and have a couple of cones and sit down on the couch and watch the book. Um, you're giving these guys criminal records for a flower, you know, a plant, and you know, the Chinese have been using it for food and medicine for thousands of years. And here we are, oh, I've always sort of grown up as New Zealand's a, a you know, poor plant, no technology, keep you doing green, which is a joke, but, um, yeah, I think on the medical side of it, there's always people that aren't going to grow up and are going to want to buy it. So I think there definitely should be a license. Um, I propose a my license that it gets grown hydroponically indoors, where it's controlled, um, you're getting it the same quality THC and everything else, and then it's passed on to the next person who wants to create, you know, manuka and marijuana hunt, for instance. And, you know, there's multi million there. So I think for Joe Fox, it needs to be left. If they want to grow a couple of plants out in the back with their mother, it's fine. Um, if they've got a whole backyard covered in marijuana, well, yeah, that's another story. That is. And I think you should be sitting fine for people that don't follow that plan much harder than alcohol or cigarettes. And if you can if you've got more than three plants growing in the backyard, there should be a minimum of $1,000 fine. And if you're caught supplying it under 18, there should be a $4,000 fine. And you don't get around these points you but the next one is get a double, eight thousand dollars. Two things aren't all the head, like you can't do that. This is what it is. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Yeah.
Bruce, that's very helpful. That is our time. Thank you very much. We have got your submission in front of us. Thank you for calling in today. Thank you. Good to go. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Bruce. Good, Good day. Good. Do we have Megan Ransom in the room? Hi, Megan. Would you like to come up to the table? I think you've seen the format as to uh, how the committee how the committee works. So, uh, welcome to the select committee. <coughs> uh, we have five minutes with you, Megan. The time is yours. If you're able to leave questions, that would be that would be good. But the time oh. is yours. Please, please go ahead. Thank you. And my name is Megan Ransom. Next month, I'll be fifty. I've spent a whole lifetime from, as from a very, very, very young child um, with sexual abuse, um, uh, lots of different abuses, and I suffer from severe PTSD, anxiety, depression, and I also live in a world of condemnation um, with one of the world's most indiscriminate and historically condemned illnesses to ever exist. I live with mental and physical, I live mentally and physically within this tortured life that I have with very little hope within a mental health system that functions at the bottom of the cliff, clinging to medications that might alleviate some symptoms but always being told there is no cure and there are no alternatives. To be here and involved in this new hope proves the country's willingness to openly, dis to openly discussing and joining other forward-thinking countries in granting this process to begin. This gives me hope. Gives me a chance of a future that I desperately need and that I desperately deserve. I deserve this opportunity to have access to the prescribed pharmaceutical medica medical marijuana that does bring a new plateau of medication for mental health patients suffering daily within our own mental torture and ability to have a life like so many other human beings have. It will give me quality to my life. Um, I guess you have a copy of my we, story. We, we do. We have read it. Yes, thank you. I've just recently been diagnosed, I've, I've, uh, I'm on ACC now, and I've recently been diagnosed with the severe PTSD, which means that the original diagnosis of um, bipolar 2 is incorrect. I have, with, along with my pharmacist, worked out that over the 20 years I have digested 5.5 kilos of lithium, and it also equates to 660 double-A batteries. We have this at our fingertips. I deserve this. You have nothing but people here with ill health, misery. You're allowed some change. And I know that you are aware of the mental health system in New Zealand, there's been no change there. There will be no change there until we can make headway with this. Thank you. Sarah, I, I'm open to questions. Thank you. We will take some questions. Angie, we'll start with you if you have any questions. Um, actually, I don't have any questions, but I do want to thank you for sharing your story and um, your submission. Um, and... Um, I think the change in your diagnosis is, is particularly interesting for, um, for women who have experienced what you have. So thank you for sharing that. Um, that's all. That drug that I am on now um, is something that they found uh, work, that worked for people with low blood pressure and they now treat people with severe PTSD. So what it does is it takes away uh, and, and, it, and it helps with the um, nightmares and also the constant flashbacks during the day as well and conversation and that's just been minimalised and I feel like I'm starting to be able to live and start achieving some things. Mm. Thank you. Liz Craig, do you have any questions? Good. Matt, did you have anything? 
really good presentation. Thank, thank, you, thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. Good. Do we have Rochelle Venables in the room, please? Good afternoon, Rochelle. Hi, oh, yeah. Come on up to the table. Have a seat. Rochelle, uh, welcome to the Health Select Committee. Uh, thank you for making a submission, which you can take as read that we have read. Uh, the time is in your hands. We have roughly five minutes to, uh, to understand what you wanted to tell us. So please, please go ahead. The time is yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, I never thought that I'd be a gambler putting $600 down in hopes that you might make this law even slightly more helpful to families across this nation. Our sons legally prescribe CBD oil cost $40 per day. So this speech and its related costs to get here represents two weeks of medicine that allows our 22-year-old son with high and complex needs, including autism, relief from debilitating agony. I'm not sure if you've ever seen someone whose class is non-verbal. Sensory issues express agonising pain. Try to picture violent frustration at everyone and everything. Torture is what I witnessed in my son's eyes when in brief moments of sedated cognition he would actually even glance at me. When you have experienced supporting a family member through years of this, then even if there is only a glimmer of hope, that something might work, I'm sure like us, that you would do everything regardless of the cost. But there is a substantial cost and some pretty big flaws in the current and proposed legally prescribed CBD oil system. Foremost being, we have no guarantee that purchasing a legal farmer grade bottle of Tilray CBD oil is actually going to have the same profound therapeutic relief as the first bottle we purchased. After letters from our GP and his pharmacist to Tilray, stating that it was clear the second bottle of CBD oil we'd purchased had absolutely no therapeutic value, a bottle worth more than $600 that was delivered non-refrigerated on a day when outside courier fan temperatures reached a record 40 degrees in our region. Tilray did replace that bottle months later, but we are still experiencing significant variation in efficacy from bottle to bottle. We now have to make sure that we have at least two bottles available so we can gradually introduce a new bottle while recording its effectiveness or lack of effectiveness thereof. To be honest, I feel ripped off knowing that others have a more consistent form of organic medicine growing in their backyard for next to nothing. I have no judgment towards him, but certainly towards this harsh law that is us using our KiwiSaver retirement funds under financial hardship, wondering what will be the next thing we have to sacrifice just so that we can fill the next prescription. So what does effective pain relief and quality of life cost for our son? Surprisingly, it could in the future cost millions less, less over his lifetime to the taxpayer. Consider what 24-7, either one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one, -on -one, intensive support costs over a lifetime or, or a day in a locked ward costing hundreds of dollars today, a day. And then consider a young man on a constantly, or consistently effective, affordable form of CBD oil grown and prepared by his parents, the same parents who cannot continue to pay the current legal option of $40 per day on a minimum wage paid family carer's income. And now consider this extraordinary young man trying new words each day learning to be more independent each day, attempting new experiences and making friends, having his local community amazed at his progress 
as he begins to build his own community connections for the first time in his adult life. Imagine if his parents could be able to return to work in their qualified fields, spend more time with his three siblings, earn an average wage, be able to afford his sister's braces, tell his papa to please not put off for time because of the financial burden assisting us with his grandson's $40 per day on current legal pain relief. And while you're imagining this possibility, go a step further and see politicians who are brave enough to make this happen by extending the statutory defence for growing medicinal cannabis to include those with long, long-term debilitating conditions, allowing a family member to do this for them without risk of prosecution. In closing, I'd like to point out that while there are risks to extending this statutory defence to those with long-term debilitating conditions and their caregivers on their behalf, I personally don't believe that that entrusted risk would be abused. Why would I, for example, abuse the compassionate law to allow me to grow affordable medicine for my son when I clearly know the consequences of not being able to? I'll leave you with this. Think of a political historian in the year 2099, looking back on this select committee's mandate to make a more compassionate law. Would they shake their heads and wonder as to why you were not brave enough to make a law that would actually make a difference to all those suffering long-term debilitating conditions and their families that are affected so much? Michelle, thank you so much for sharing very, very personal moments and observations. We have time for questions. Matt, I'll ask you first. Do you have any sure. Questions? Thank you very much um, for sharing with us your story today. Um, so your argument around statutory defence for, um, I think currently in the bill, it's for terminal illness. No. And, and yeah. the, the scope to be widened, some people are arguing for chronic pain. Now, if I understood you rightly, would you classify your son's condition as fitting classically under a chronic pain umbrella, or are you arguing that Certainly. we could actually stretch the umbrella a bit further? We've had to we've had to advocate significantly for doctors to actually know that he's in pain, but we know him best. Even as a non-verbal person, we can tell that he's in pain. Mm. Um, so we would be advocating for debilitating conditions like yeah. this. You know, yeah. the difference that it makes, you you have absolutely, like it's profound, the difference for him to suddenly go from morphine, gabapentin, all of these things that everybody else has listed, all of those things, and and the side effects being from the antipsychs that they gave him because they're trying to just, just make all of his autism problems go away and the pain go away, but not dealing with it, not finding it. It's really hard with a non-verbal person, but CBD oil on a good bottle will actually work. Mm. We've never, we, he woke up and he looked me in the eye. He wanted to take selfies on my phone. He, he went into a GR, he, a, a general anaesthetic, which would normally take seven adults to get him in there, into theatre, just for normal dental work. This is what you deal with someone with high and complex care needs. When he was on CBD oil, we took him in. He walked into the theatre and he lay down on the table and he just needed a little bit of help when that scary mask came down on his face. After the surgery, one of the surgeons came to see us. He'd known our son for a while. They all know him by name. That's how complex he is. He came to us with his cup of coffee in his hand and he was on his break and he said, I just had to come and see you because I just cannot believe it's the same young man in there and I cannot believe you're the same parents. Now, I look a bit sleep deprived today, but you imagine living sleep deprived for 21 and I don't know, I think it's like three or four months before we actually felt so relieved that he was out of pain and we could sleep and he slept. So in, in this bill, the, the scheduling of CBD 
is, is that enough to, to not, provide access? Why would it be enough when no one can afford it? Do you yeah. know what we have sacrificed? We, we, we gave up our careers to care for him before we even tackled this. We just, we just took a risk. We went into the pharmacy. We finally got the prescription that nobody else, lots of people we know can't even get that prescription. The doctor's not even going to sign off on it. And we finally got the prescription and we thought we'd just go and see how we could afford this, how much it might actually be. And the pharmacy said, I'm not making any, pay, any money off your son's pain. I've seen your journey. He said, I'll let you pay it off. And so we went back the next day. So this is just before New Year's Day. And we picked up that bottle. We were crying because when we got back to the car, he handed us a voucher for the same money, that the $200 that we'd put down to pay for groceries and petrol because he knew that we wouldn't even have enough for them because we'd put down the first payment. So, so no, not in its current form. This law will not help New Zealanders. If someone's already on a supported living payment, my son can't pay that cost. And we are paying that cost. And his family is paying that cost. And our community is paying that cost. And if he had access to this, afford, if it was affordable and he could grow it, we could grow it on his behalf and make that product for him. I, I just... I just don't know if you could comprehend how much money it actually saved the taxpayer in his care costs around the other side of this. It's incredible. Michelle, this is a very uh, clear and uh, compelling submission. Um, thank, thank you very much for uh, sharing with us what you've shared, and uh, as we have with others, we'll certainly take on board what you've told us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So can I just check, do we have Kelly Watty in the room? Kelly will do. No, that, that's all right, sorry, we'll keep on, keep on moving. Uh, Tina moses Penny. Hi Tina, come on through, come on through to the table. Kia ora. Join us. Welcome to the Health Select Committee. Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, we have read your submission, so take it as read. Um, we have five minutes with you. You're here today. Please tell us what we need to know. Go ahead. Um, so kia ora. I'm um, Tina, and this is my niece, Casey. Kia ora. And this happy looking fellow over here is Casey's daddy and my brother, Charlie um, Moses Penny. And we've come from the Hokianga today <coughs> to represent him. Me too. Whereabouts in the Hokianga? Uh, Rawini. Oknoni. Uh, Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all go out on the <laughs> yeah. like, Lucky yeah. us. Yeah. There you go. Go ahead. <laughs> no, so, um, in September of last year, Charlie was riding his motorbike and he ended up with a compression fracture to his lower spine. And by October, November, he was diagnosed with terminal bone and lung cancer. Um, as you saw in my submission, Charlie's journey with cancer had gone, has gone on for many, many years. And unfortunately, on the 4th of this month, um, his journey with us in this physical realm came to an end. Charlie had a wicked sense of humour and an amazing attitude to life and living. Um, his story gave hope and inspiration to many, many people. We hope that continues today. Oh, get it together. Right. Charlie had never, ever used cannabis before. Um, this diagnosis, and he'd done lots of research on his own about the benefits that cannabis could give to those who were suffering, not just about cancer, it was about other illnesses to him as well. And that's why he opted to try it this time round, and it worked. As his 24-7 caregivers, Casey and I first saw firsthand the benefits that cannabis, medicinal cannabis, had given to him, particularly when he was in severe pain, when he was anxious, when he was nauseous, when he couldn't sleep, and when he couldn't eat. It's heartbreaking to see someone you love struggling and suffering with opioid toxicity. That's not pretty. Absolutely heartbreaking. Um, we were committed to do more to support him because we loved him. Um, and we thank those green fairies out there who supported us on this journey and they continue to support many other families out there. They risk so much to us, the champions of compassion. Anyhow, so here we go. Right, one, we need access to medicinal cannabis now. Two to three years is too late. 
Our people are suffering now. <laughs> we ask this government support to support a, d a domestic organic medicinal cannabis market that provides access to safe and affordable products. Existing green fairies and med medicinal cannabis advocates already have the expertise and knowledge. They are already providing medicinal cannabis products to patients that work. At the very least, extend the legal defence to cover them right now and then allow them to get licences when the domestic scene is set up. Two, we are constantly hearing that there's not enough evidence to prove that medicinal cannabis works. We're here today, three more voices to add to the already thousands of patients and families who are actually telling you that it does. We ask that this government support those patients with terminal illness, severe pain and chronic conditions to be given the opportunity to try and or use medicinal cannabis to improve their quality of life. At age 61, my brother, for the first time in his life, in the eyes of the New Zealand criminal system, was a criminal just because he used it to relieve him of his symptoms. And for the first time in our lives, Casey and I became co-offenders just because we supported him. <laughs> the current bill as it stands would not have helped him or us during this time because legal, legal defence does not apply. <laughs> we ask that this government support those patients with terminal illness, severe pain and chronic conditions and their nominated carers exemption from prosecution. And this allows the carers to help the patients both purchase and administer when they are unable to, which is what Charlie couldn't do. Um, so that's pretty much it for me. Sorry about the tears, but um, yeah, thank you for giving us the opportunity today. Thank you. Angie, do you have any questions? I don't. I don't really. Thank you for um, thank you for for coming all this way. I know how long that journey is. <laughs> Um, it just just a comment really. One of the themes that is coming out is around an amnesty period until licensing. So I take it from your submission that would be what you would be asking for an amnesty period until licensing, etc. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to say anything? Or? No. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Do you have any questions? Thank you for sharing. Um, I just recently lost my mum as well, and it's really mm -hmm. well here. And, um, and it's really great that you've achieved that, and I hope you can achieve something for families. And that's just brilliant. Thank you. We want to talk to you as part here today. I wish you well in your travels. Thank you very much for a very good presentation. No order, Mike. Thank you. Good. Uh, I think we're to the teleconference now. Dr. Susan Hickey. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Good yeah, good afternoon. This is Dr. Shane Reddy speaking, Deputy Chair of the Health Select Committee. Around the table this afternoon are my colleague MPs, MP Matt Ducey, Angie Warren-Clark and Dr. Liz Craig. We've received your submission and we have read it. Thank you very much for that. And this is an opportunity for you to speak to us over the next five minutes. So, so please, please go ahead. The time is yours. Thank you very much. Well, kia ora, um, Chair and the Honourable MPs. Uh, I'm actually talking to you from a hospital bed just now, I've just become fully paralysed down my right side, uh, down to my MS, and it's from the inability to continue to use my pill rate because I can no longer afford it. My submission was around, um, I want to just focus on a three base points. One is that I really do ask that we consider expanding the major party bill from terminal to chronic conditions as well because by excluding those, you're excluding a very large part of people in being. And that's including children, seizures, terminal people, people like myself. 
The other um, area that I'd really like you to consider is the cost. I have spent over 28000 in the last two and a half to three years using Savvy for the until rate. I'm a super responder, which means I'm doing very well on it, but I can no longer afford it. I can't pay $1,000 a month anymore. And as a result, it means I'll be going on to back, uh, back on to around 100 tablets a day, morphine, gabapentin, tramadol, uh, DHC syndrome, and paracetamol. And what that does damages my liver and my kidneys, and uh, it's shortening my life. So I guess I'm asking that when we consider this bill, that we look at the cost that the legal medicine is already costing people. Most cannot afford it, and we, we don't have a system where we can get insurance from that for it. So we need to be looking at a realistic range around costing. The uh, final point I just want to emphasise is the decriminalisation. As a lawyer, my background in law, I believe it's time that we stop criminalising around drugs. We're wasting over $100,000 per person a year in the prison when we could be putting that into health and we could be doing a good medicinal cannabis program and a health program where those who need help can get the help they need. Uh, those are the three main points I just wanted to centre on really. Uh, I won't hold you guys up because I know that you're busy. But uh, if you've got any questions, I'm happy to emphasise on anything and expand on anything. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for your time. We'll make our way around the table for any questions. A very, very detailed and thoughtful written submission. Um, Angie Warren Clark, any questions from you? Actually, I just I just have a comment. Huhana, um, Sue, it's yes. it's Ange Clark. So I'm just greeting oh. you. I'm just greeting you from all those years ago at university together. Um, keep up the fight, oh, my friend. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> keep up the fight, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. No questions. Good, a very uh, compact and concise submission. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll certainly take on board what you've, what you've told us. Thank you. Thanks indeed. Very good. Uh, Donald Tefai. Go to Mr. David Beechgood at the teleconference. <coughs> we can take note of uh, uh, Donald's written submission. Yeah. He's talking about licensing, the importance of licensing. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi. This is Dr Shane Reedy, Deputy Chair of the Health Select Committee. Around the table this afternoon we have MPs Matt Ducey, Angie Warren-Clark and Dr Liz Craig. Thank you very much for your written submission, which we've read, and this is an opportunity to speak to you in person. So we have roughly five minutes to, to listen to what you'd like to tell us. So pl please go ahead. But the time is certainly yours. Uh, we have read the okay. article, but you're welcome to summarise, and then it's always a good idea to leave questions sure. if you're able to. But totally up to you. Okay. Well, I don't want to go over the ground that I did. Other people are going over. Uh, 
uh, about who should have be right, be free to have cannabis or not. I want to address the main question for me, which is the, uh, <coughs> the fear of cannabis as a cause of harm. And uh, I think this is what changed people's attitudes towards it, and I think it explains why it's so difficult uh, New Zealand to make headway here. And I think this is the main problem with this bill, that it that this assumption that cannabis causes harm, and therefore the bill is taking a very tiny step in uh, regulating and, uh, and reforming cannabis. So the main point I'm making is that the evidence that supports the idea that cannabis causes harm is really pretty shocking and inadequate. I mean, it's, it's, it's mainly based upon correlation, and the data which the correlations are used um, are not that particularly good data. They're not experimental data. They're, uh, they're survey type data, and it's very, very. It's not correct to draw inferences from correlations that you can establish as a fact that cannabis is a, is a contributory cause to um, something like. So I think the big, the big problem, the main bugbear we have to deal with is this whole idea of reefer madness, which nowadays uh, talks about in the literature as a link between cannabis and, and psychosis. So you'll see that in the article um, I put a lot of emphasis upon one particular review study by Peter <coughs> and Hart. Um, I don't know if you've read that, but you can certainly get access to it in the medical. So that article actually um, makes the point very clearly, I think, that the, the quality of the data that exists out there, there's a lot of it, is not sufficient to establish a claim of cause, and it's much more likely that instead of cannabis being a contributory cause or contributory factor, which seems to be the assumption, that it is one of the many things that occur particularly by young people where this claim is most um, strongly made, um, that are much broader than the question of cannabis itself. So that the, uh, the, the authors conclude that the, the particular theory or particular approach that they have brought or prefer on the basis of the evidence that they have been able to establish is uh, one of uh, sheer vulnerability. So that some individuals um, and the drug bringing and so on, uh, may have a propensity towards both experimenting and drug taking, uh, including using cannabis, and, and also be exposed towards some of the symptoms that um, are described in psychiatric, namely, the most commonly, anxiety, depression, um, paranoia, and such things, which when they get to an excessive debilitating stage are clearly labeled as, uh, as psychiatric. If not psychosis, uh, precursors to psychosis. Um, that's another whole area that I haven't gone into. Uh, there, I think the, the evidence is also fairly weak. But, but basically, that's what I'm saying. That um, I don't agree with this bill because I don't think it has a, a sufficient courage to actually stand up and say, "Look, um, 50 percent of New Zealanders um, agree that cannabis should be decriminalised or legalised. 80 percent of New Zealanders think that medical cannabis is okay. Real liberal organisations think that not." Federal government should be okay. Um, so why are we lagging? Why are we taking, breaking our feet and even uh, re releasing or restricting or, or de decriminalising uh, medical cannabis? And to limit it to treatment, treatment patients, I think is, is bizarre. Um, when I first read the bill, I thought, is this how I made a mistake? I just read it, is it actually the bill? Is it euthanasia as opposed to um, a cannabis reform? But, uh, so I think that this legislation is moving in a tiny direction on the right step, but the big problem is that it's still to be dealt by the assumption of harm, and so it's just covering its tra tracks and attempting to, I think, go to public opinion with us, because it's not only public opinion, it's my ears. So it's trading public opinion, and it's also trading in terms of the evidence, the science, the good science that's out there now, it's not adopting or not considering the good science that's there, as um, I think represented in this particular case, and particularly in my view, uh, the work of people like Kassir and Hart. So uh, that's the basic gist of what I have to say, so I'll leave it up to you to ask questions if you wish. Thank you, uh, David. I will take the question to this. Uh, you've summarised 
three substantive parts to what you put in your submission. First of all, you've talked to the harm model, and others have supported that as well, i.e. that cannabis uh, may not be as harmful as others might project it. Secondly, that uh, overdoses are toxic and even cause death. Others have supported the fallacy to that. But you're the first person to raise the question of debunking the myth of cannabis being a gateway drug. Can you just talk to that for a moment? Well, no, I'm not. Uh, well, it may be a fairly few years. It's true, but I mean, it's now pretty common. And I think you'll see that that's also the case. Um, I think that that was the Digital Drug Foundation takes that view as well. So I think it's fairly well established now that it's not a gateway drug. If you have anything, it's something that happens in association with taking other drugs. But the evidence that people go from cannabis to other drugs, uh, and that that is the real, real problem. I don't think it's been established. I certainly don't agree with it. But I have to accept that I, don't, I haven't spent a lot of time looking at that. Very useful uh, submission. I recall seeing one earlier today that I think had four or five pages giving us background on libertarianism and mills, which sort of runs a little bit into your, your harm model. Very, very useful. We've, of course, read it already. I'm sure we'll come back and read it again, and your verbal presentation is useful as well. David, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Okay, bye. Okay, we're in person with uh, Dr. Bartels. Dr. Bartels, hey, yeah. Welcome to the Select Committee. I'm sure you've seen the format as to how we conduct these Select Committee proceedings today. Uh, we have roughly about five minutes to chat with you and, and listen and understand what you'd like to tell us. The time is yours. If you wish to leave questions, please do. So please just go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, you have to bear with me a little bit. Um, we've just had a newborn baby and I've spent the weekend in hospital with my daughter. We'll see how we go. Um, good. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, the fact that this bill has passed is a great start, um, but there's more to be done. And while I fully support medicinal cannabis for adults, I'm actually here to speak for the children that could also benefit. Um, my wife and I have had three daughters. Little were we to know that our genetics were a bad match. And after our second daughter was born, uh, we got the devastating diagnosis of inosine triphosphate pyrophosphatase, encephalopathy. A uh, very rare disease, there's only seven known cases plus our girls in the world, and it was only discovered in 2015. Uh, it's an extremely rare terminal condition, which results in death and infancy, and has made our two oldest girls fully dependent on us. Developmentally, they are like newborn babies. They have severe epilepsy, are immobile, and she's dead. Um, this is Leah, our eldest. This is Anya, our second oldest. Our oldest daughter, Leah, started seizing at three months old. We needed a starship for status epilepticus, after which we were told doctors could do nothing for her. We should go home and love her, which we did. This was one month before Christmas, and they didn't think she'd make it. At this time, she was heavily sedated on a midazolam pump, 60 milligrams a day, uh, which was crazy enough to knock out an adult. On top of this, she tried at least 10 different medications. Some worked, some didn't, and many had bad side effects. Phenobarbitone, that suppresses breathing. Peraldehyde, a medication that is given rectally but dissolves plastic bottles and syringes. Other medications that cause deterioration of vision. Increased secretions and irritability, to name a few. We managed to wean her off the midazolam pump, and she lived to see her first Christmas. For the next two years, she battled on, fighting off status events every few months until one day she'd had enough. At two and a half, after a month in the hospital in a drug-induced coma, she passed away in our arms the night after we got home from hospital. Our second daughter, Anya's journey, has been slightly different. and large, we believe, because we've chosen to manage her symptoms with less input from many of these pharmaceutical drugs. Anya is now four. She has seizures, gastric issues, which means she doesn't tolerate food into her stomach, so she's generally fed, and weighs a tiny 7.8 kgs, having not put on weight in over two years. She doesn't sleep through the night, but naps for two hours at a time. Uh, it's extremely taxing on her, me, and, my, and her mother. And the latest medication we've tried, clonazepam, to try and get her to sleep, has landed her in hospital twice, uh, which is why we're there on the weekend. 
with the side effects of respiratory depression and increased secretions. We're still trying to get access to MC products that are safe for her and other children like her. Uh, these products still exist overseas. We just need to get them into New Zealand, while at the same time we should be establishing a medicinal cannabis industry in New Zealand because it's a great opportunity for the country. Sadly, we have attended the funerals of four other children, aged five and under, in the past three years, and know of many more. I firmly believe that Leah and Anya and their friends could well have benefited from access to medicinal cannabis. I find it hard to comprehend that our kids can be on, sorry, can be put on all these pharmaceuticals, but medicinal cannabis, we just can't go there. Two of these little kids have been on morphine and, medazel, uh, morphine and methadone pumps at the ages of one and five years old, and these children have now passed. These medications all have their place. I'm not bagging them, but I think, why can't medicinal cannabis be an option? Why can't the parents of these children have that choice? We need this for Anya, Ava, Kane, Ewan, Heather, and Kim. And in loving memory of Leah, Isaac, Maddox, Bree, Isabel, Isabella, and Maeve. Maybe, just maybe, if they'd had access to medicine cannabis, they may still be with us. Thank you. That is a very compelling presentation. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us, is there any evidence that, that you're aware of, I understand this is a rare condition, that cannabis might actually help, or you're just looking for the tools to at least have it as an option? I'd say both. Um, I know of plenty of children overseas with uh, not the, obviously the same condition, but mm -hmm. severe refractory epilepsy sure. that are doing well on medicinal cannabis in various forms, okay. both pharmaceutical and other. Oh, we have time for one question. Matthew, so if you have more questions. Um, so I suppose the, 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 the detail is quite light on the regime currently. So, I mean, yes, we should look at what we can set up within New Zealand. Of course, that will take time. Correct. Are you, do you feel that there's the products available yes. internationally that we Correct. could bring in? that would make a difference? I mean, the fact that GW Pharmaceuticals are looking into this kind of says volumes, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what, again, because the detail's quite, quite light around the regime, we haven't really got deep into it, but it's, uh, it's almost what you're advocating for is that we, we need to make sure we're doing something in the short to medium term as well as the long term. Yeah. And that's looking at... Um, at uh, what's happening internationally and, and the products over there. Yeah. yeah, there's products in America and Canada uh, that would be quite appropriate for, for children like this. Mm. And were you able to um, uh, attempt to access them online? Did you ever try that through your own experience? Uh, it is possible, yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Sam, thank you very much. Uh, we will do the best we can to lessen your burden. So thank you. Thank you very much. transfer from the other committee, <clears throat> so we won't have electronic notes, but I'm sure we can pick them up later. Okay. So do we have Sky Douglas? Uh, hi, Sky. Come on, come on up to the table. Please have a seat. Um, I'm just saying to my team that uh, the electronic notes will follow you because you've come from another committee, but that's not <coughs> a problem. That's another problem. So if you'd like to tell us what we'd like to know, Sky, we have uh, at least five minutes with you. If you wanted to leave time for questions, do so also. But the time is yours, so please go ahead. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I am Sky Douglas, and I've travelled here today from Whangarei, where I was born and raised, um, to speak here. Uh, prior to moving home in January of last year, I lived abroad, primarily in Washington State, USA, where I am a medical marijuana patient. I was prescribed uh, cannabis oil to treat inflammation, 
from head injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, which anxiety and depression was a result of. This plant was remarkable in my recovery, and it was almost instant in my recovery. And so since then, I have studied this plant. I also worked in the nursing industry for Washington State Department of Health. I have witnessed its application in Parkinson's disease, in head injury, in Crohn's disease, epilepsy, chronic pain, just to name a few. This plant is ancient. It is an anti-inflammatory. It is an antioxidant. And some strains strengthen the immune system. Last year, in desperation to get off pharmaceutical drugs, Zopiclone and Lorazepam, which did not work for me, I interviewed doctors and asked them if they could prescribe cannabis oil for me. Some didn't even know they could or that it was available. Um, some said, well, we can prescribe it, but there's no product other than um, Sativex, which was a pharmaceutical grade isolated compound at the exorbitant cost of $1,400 a month. Um, and then another said that the paperwork that they had to do on this it just really wasn't worth their time. Well, not only has this plant been used for thousands of years uh, for medicine, but it's also been used for food and materials, building materials, fabric, fuel, and uh, paper. Um, and with the agricultural crisis we have on our hands today, water crisis, um, if every farmer were to replace some of their cattle and grow hemp, not only would this create revenue, it would create jobs, food, medicine, materials, and fuel. This is, you know, all the research is there. Um, it is my understanding that the pharmaceutical industry do not want this plant decriminalized because they profit from this plant being criminal. They, they, lo they are losing their profit and their power worldwide because of this plant. I feel it, it would be unethical to withhold this medicine that does help not only people but animals as well because they too have an endocannabinoid system. Um, your decisions have a huge impact on the people of New Zealand. I sit here in testimony of its um, efficient efficacy, and um, I think that not only should it be used for the terminally ill, oh, I have witnessed it in the use of cancers too, and I missed out. Personally, I've used it for skin cancer. It took three weeks to completely get rid of my basal cell carcinoma on my face, on my hands, and on my feet. And it just left a little red mark. There's a documentary series out called The Sacred Plant. And it's the research and findings of Professor Raphael Mahulam and Professor Guzman and their colleagues who have been researching this plant since the early 1960s and discovered and isolated the active components in cannabis sativa. Also, they discovered that all mammals have an en the endocannabinoid system and that all mammals have an endocannabinoid system. Uh, with receptor sites in our brain and body, which fit exactly like lock and key into the cannabinoids found in this plant, it also gives people personal testimonies and use of its effectiveness in healing, I recommend this informative video to you. It's widely available. It's gone viral. You might even be able to look at it on YouTube. There have been over 2,000 modern peer-reviewed scientific articles on the pharmacology of cannabis and its cannabinoids 
that have been published by medical journals further confirming the medicinal properties of marijuana. Guy, thank you very much. Thank you for emailing me about 10 days ago as well. It was very useful. Good. Uh, we have time for a question. Uh, Angie, do you have a question? <coughs> um, I don't, actually. Sorry, I was just going to try to put in sacred plant, but it didn't pop up anywhere. But I will... The um, sacred plant, maybe? But I, I can also answer a question you had earlier about defining chronic pain. Um, with Cannabis is uh, anti-inflammatory. And as doctors, you know that pain and disease is a result of inflammation. So this actually takes care of inflammation. Thank you. Thank you, Sky. You've uh, travelled a distance today. <laughs> thank you very much for, for your submission and for uh, sharing your information with us. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Are we to Bobby Carroll by Kelly Monkins? Okay, Bobby Carroll. Yes, hello, Bobby. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, hi, Bobby. This is Dr. Shane Reedy, Deputy Chair of the Health Select Committee. Round the table this afternoon. Hello, we have our other MPs, Matt Ducey, Angie Warren Clark, and Dr. Liz Craig. We have your submission in front of us, so thank you for sending it to us. It has been read. We have roughly five minutes with you. Um, the time is yours. If you'd like to leave time for questions, that would be fine also. But uh, very much up to you. Please go ahead, Bobby. And hello and good afternoon to the committee. Um, so that's good you've all got a copy of my submission. I'll just bring you up to date. Um, I am now on a new pharmaceutical drug which is um, not funded by the New Zealand government. So I have privately purchased it from overseas. This will add approximately 18 months to the time when I relapse, which is an unknown time. I would like the committee to decriminalise for all people with debilitating illness, regardless of life expectancy. I would like cannabis decriminalised for everyone over the age of 65, The reason for this is so many elderly people use sleeping pills and other medication which can easily be replaced by cannabis, medicinal cannabis. It's also a quality of life. I'm prescribed sleeping pills, I'm, I'm so many drugs, I only take the ones that I medically need. So sleeping pills, anti-nausea, pharmaceutical drugs like that, that all have side effects, I prefer not to take and I use medicinal cannabis instead. Now I wish them just Make something clear, I do not smoke cannabis. I do not like the headstone. I make cookies and I make cannabis chocolate and I eat it. It is brilliant instead of sleeping cold, it is brilliant instead of anti nausea. But on top of that, it's absolutely fabulous for my quality of life. 
I don't know. I'm sure he must be someone on the health select committee um, that had a, a dear friend or family member with terminal cancer, which I have. Anything that improves your quality of life is brilliant. And as an example, I'd like to tell you of one day when I'd had my chemotherapy, and the day after I had treatment, as well as the worst, I had some chocolate, and a couple of hours later, I found myself and my partner outside on the deck in the rain, dancing. <laughs> now, we stopped and we looked at the rain and we looked at ourselves and we laughed and laughed and laughed. I don't want anyone commission to do that. I'm 65. I have two adult children and an adult stepson. I have three grandchildren, 19, 16, and 13. I live in my own freehold house. Just last week, I got the big graduation. I will look after my quality of life and minimize the drugs I have to take if I have to. The fact that it's a crime is in itself a crime. I don't know how the committee is going to get around the logistics to stop people feigning ill health. That is not my problem. My issue is I don't think I, in, in my state of life with my cancer, I should have to ask anyone's permission or anyone's forgiveness. And I don't. Is Louisa not there today? Uh, we're actually in several subcommittees so that we can gather all the information we can, but certainly our transcripts and our evidence and all of these submissions are available to, to everyone, Bobby. Mm -hmm. Has the committee got any questions for me? No, we've circled around the table. It's a really good submission that you've made. And uh, I think the verbal presentation you gave, you've given, is very good. Also, you've certainly give us a, a good visual image, and I think we would say to you, dance and laugh in the rain some more, Bobby. Actually, yeah. so yeah. thank you very much. I'm going to. You, I'm you. going to. <laughs> and I belong to a support group of people with blood cancer. It's a cancer that targets most people, 55 plus. And very few of us use sleeping pills, very few of us use anti-nausea, very few of us believe that I don't drink alcohol. I had neurosurgery 18 years ago, and since then I haven't been able to drink alcohol, which is a horrific, depressing drug. Just bring us up to speed. Just decriminalise cannabis. Bobby, thank you very much for your presentation. We'll certainly take on board what you've told us. You have a really good day. Thank you again. Thank you, Shane. Bye. Bye bye. James Harlan, uh, teleconference.
Good afternoon, James. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi, James. This is Dr. Shane Reddy speaking, Deputy Chair of the Health Select Committee. Around the table this afternoon, we have MPs Matt Ducey, Angie Warren Clark, and Dr. Liz Craig. Thank you very much for making the time. We have read your submission, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. You have roughly uh, five minutes. The time is yours. If you wish to leave questions, please do. But effectively, the time is yours. Please go ahead, James. Okay, thank you. I won't be reading the whole thing again. I can hardly remember what I actually wrote. But I'll just go over a few points. Um, firstly, um, there's um, no advantage at all in doing what talk show hosts say and legalise or decriminalise cannabis or other drugs. I wonder if they just say this just to bait listeners. Um, I'd like to make the point, and I don't think I made this in the uh, submission, that if cannabis is decriminalised for medical purposes, then there should not be any availability of cannabis companies to be able to advertise to the public like can be done at the moment with various other drugs, like arthritis drugs and um, uh, asthma drugs and things like that. So I think any legislation that changes the status quo should have something in it that says that um, people can't make profit out of it by advertising and having to make everybody else listen to those advertisements on air um, or TV. Um, I think the message should be to anybody who is on any kind of illicit drugs that they first get off the drug and prove it before they get any reduction in their symptoms. Um, drug addiction is an awful thing. I've had to work with people who have been drug addicted in my career and I can tell you that it devastates families and it wrecks people and it needs to be stopped whatever way it can be. Um, if there's going to be cannabis for medicinal purposes, and I'm fully in agreement that if a doctor prescribes cannabis because the doctor thinks it's necessary, then the doctor should be able to prescribe cannabis, but it should be in a regulated, managed dose. Now, all of the media uh, comments on this so far uh, seem to be on the basis that um, it should be decriminalised, but there's nothing there that says that um, people should be uh, having controlled clean cannabis. There, all, there seems to be all this nonsense about people being able to go and buy cannabis to give to Granny to help her if she's in pain because she's dying from cancer. There was even one person that ran the talk show on one day that said that the only way they could get Granny to take the cannabis was if they breathed it down Granny's nostrils. Now that is just ridiculous. There's nothing more stupid than a person who's got lung, lungs that are wrecked from cannabis or tobacco smoking cannabis supposedly for pain. So there needs to be another way that they get the cannabis other than by smoking it. And the best way for that to happen is for um, a doctor to administer it either by a tablet or an injection or some other way um, that is a clean way of dealing with it. Vaping is just a ridiculous way of dealing with anything and that should be um, banned as well. Now, as far as I'm concerned, there should be no home growing of cannabis and one stupid MP put together a bill thinking that it would be cool, if you like, for people to be able to grow cannabis for their own use um, for medicinal purposes. Now, that is just ridiculous. You can't trust drug users, okay? You um, cannot trust drug dealers. They are evil individuals. You shouldn't be able to buy cannabis for medicinal purposes from the pimp down the road. Um, you um, are well aware, no doubt, that cannabis is a gateway drug. Drug dealers simply say to cannabis buyers, I'm sorry, I'm out of cannabis at the moment, but I've got this, try this other drug, it's much better. Now, that is unacceptable, um, that is not the idea of what um, medicinal cannabis is about, and the only way to do that is for it to be properly controlled by doctors and pharmacists, and it should not be administered um, by the pharmacist, it should be controlled by a doctor as far as I'm concerned. Synthetic cannabis was an absolute and complete failure, so that proves, and you should know from the cannabis, the synthetic cannabis experiment, that proves that um, anything other than cannabis administered properly um, will not work. And, um, and the only reason why I'm saying that it should be um, used for medicinal purposes is because apparently there are people out there getting relief from it. Um, children with severe epilepsy, I think, are one group. Uh, people who are dying from pain are another group, 
However, I do question whether or not really um, cannabis is a better painkiller than um, morphine. I've never had, luckily, to take morphine and I've never had cannabis, so I can't tell you from personal experience that any of them are any good. Um, the only experience I have had from this was when my mother was given a drug called oxycodone, also known as orderly heroin, on the last day of her life. And um, there's another um, bill coming up before Parliament, which I'll make a submission on uh, with regard to that at the appropriate time. So that's about four of my five minutes, and I'm just wondering if there are any questions. James, uh, we're receiving a wide range of views, and some common themes are appearing. Uh, some in agreement with you, some not. That's the purpose of the process. No one's actually raised the question of if this should progress, the advertising of cannabis products. And that's kind of interesting. We're only one of two countries in the world that has what's called DTC, direct-to-consumer advertising, us in the US. So uh, here you've brought something new to the table, which uh, no one else has, and that, as well as the rest of your submission, is, uh, is very useful. We have time for one question. Is there anyone in the group who... Uh no, the team are very pleased with what they've heard here. Um, thank you very much, James. A really good submission. All right, just one last point, and that's that it should not be a free-for-all as is wanted by the cannabis lobby. Okay? That is not what is the good thing here. The only time it should be used is if it's absolutely necessary, and that's when a doctor says. Thank you. Thank Understood. you, and well, listening. Thank you, James. Thank you. Okay, bye. Okay, we're to our next uh, teleconference, Mr. T. L. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, hi. This is Dr. Shane Reedy speaking, Deputy Chair of the Health Select Committee. Around the table this afternoon we have MPs Matt Ducey, Angie Warren-Clark and Dr. Liz Craig. Thank you very much for the submission you've sent in and for speaking with us today. We've put aside roughly five minutes to hear you in person. The time is yours. If you wish to leave questions, please do. But otherwise, please go ahead. Ideally, 
clearly a licence for our scheme should be put in place. Um, the bill also proposes a medical cannabis access scheme. The scheme should include all forms of cannabis, dry flour, extract and preparation, not just high price pharmaceutical grade products that can only be afforded by the risk. New Zealand has a wonderful opportunity to be at the forefront of this new medical cannabis industry. We have ideal growing conditions for cannabis and a literal army of trained growers ready and waiting. Sun growing cannabis provides a significant supply of cost advantage over indoor operations. Um, it is possible to produce dry flour for medical standards. Tilray uh, are doing this in Canada with good manufacturing practices based on European medical agency standards. The, the export market for quality medical cannabis products is huge. Using an innovative approach to agriculture and biotechnology to put it at the forefront of this industry. Or we could be an isolated backwater paying multinational companies extortion of prices to convert the amazing plant into a little pill for specific. I hope the committee can see beyond this narrow vision and look towards the future of economic growth, jobs in the region, and healing patients. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that's a really good uh, submission. We notice in what you've sent to us that you talk about the descheduling of cannabidiol. I think if you look at the spectrum from ministerial approval all the way to over-the-counter, which is sort of where your, your final statement is, you can see that this bill does uh, de well, doesn't decriminalise it, but it does deschedule cannabidiol uh, down to a GP prescribing hand. Not quite as far along the schedule as you would like us to go, but it does certainly reduce it. Let me just check around the table. Any questions, Angie, Liz, Matt? No, look, everyone really pleased with uh, what you've written to us and what you've told us here today. Thank you very much for that, and we'll take into account what you've told us. Thank, thank you. Pleasure to contribute. Thanks indeed. Goodbye. Right, at teleconference, Joanna Plows. Uh, good afternoon, Joanna. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Yeah, hi, Joanna. This is Dr. Shane Reedy speaking, Deputy Chair of the Health Select Committee. Around the table this afternoon, we have MPs Matt Ducey, Angie Warren-Clark, and Dr. Liz Craig. We have received your written submission, and we have that in front of us and have read it. Thank you very much for that. This is an opportunity over the next five minutes to tell us what you'd like to tell us, and very much the time is yours. If you wish to leave questions, do so. But uh, as I say, the time is yours. So please go ahead, Joanna. Thank you. Um, I guess I just would wish to uh, emphasise the matter of choice. Um, that's how I opened my submission, um, especially for um, those who want a, um, a drug-free and symptom-free alternative in our medical toolkit. Um, I, I just find it exasperating that in 2018, we still don't have acceptance of a medical cannabis option. And in fact, it seems cruel to me if someone is experiencing relief from cannabis, then they risk arrest or possibly jail sentence for using it. And also their carers who may try to obtain it for them. Um, my partner died in 2015, but I wish I had had the cannabis option for him with some of her symptoms, including dementia. Um, and, but, and also he wouldn't have wanted to get me into trouble either, which was sad. And also the case of Nelson here, of young Alex Renton, I was very upset that um, with the two week delay, you know, for uh, young Alex died. And thinking, gosh, surely as a parent, even if your child or loved one dies in the end, you, you would want to know that you would try every option. Um, also in my submission, I have questioned this use of terminally ill for one year. By what miraculous formula um, will you use to determine how long a person has to live? Um, my best friend last week, her husband died in, in Kia in a red time. We were told the day before, we think his body is shutting down, but he may rally. 
then he died suddenly the next morning. Um, and my partner's illness was terminally ill for 10 years. Would we have only been able to use medical cannabis for the last year? And when would that have been? It is, it is fraught with difficulties. Um, and, and rightly so, but I think doctors tend not to try to, to give you a time anymore. So I, I really don't see how terminally ill for a year is going to work with the bill's suggestion. Um, and we also know from the euthanasia debate that 10% of patients cannot get relief um, from, from uh, pain from, from pharmaceutical drugs. So um, to end, I guess I'm strongly requesting um, that we add severe and debilitating illnesses to the bill without the time limit, the one year time limit, and really more research research especially with illnesses like dementia, epilepsy, MS, etc. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joanna. It's a very, very good submission. Uh, others, including ourselves, have also questioned the mirac miraculous 12-month uh, period. Indeed, the chair of the RNZCGP, Dr Tim Malloy, when asked that question, with what assurity could uh, his members say that a person would be terminal within a year, he said two things. One, that it would be impossible to decide, and secondly, that we're all terminal in some sense. So, uh, yes, we, right the <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what he said. So uh, we do um, have a, a few moments left. I'll go around the table. Angie, any questions? No, thank you Good. for your submission. It's, this here, just um, looking at the interest of dementia, which you mentioned in your submission, um, have you had a look at the overseas research on that and what's coming through? Um, no, I haven't, but I have watched quite a few programs that have been suggested. I watched a very good Australian program a little while ago about a, a younger man who, who did eventually die but was having relief from medical cannabis. Um, and I, I think believe the mention was one of the symptoms. I, I think there's a lot more research needed. Um, I haven't seen the latest, but the mention was part of my, my uh, partner's illnesses as well. And my friend whose, whose husband died last week had Alzheimer's. No, it would be um, very interesting to see as the research evolves um, what the whole spectrum of benefit can be. So thank you. Right. Thank you, but Jim. I'd just like to see more, yeah, emphasize if we could have more funding to, towards research. Yeah, or, or you say, look at, look at what's coming yeah, out from overseas. Good, Joanna, thank you very much for your presentation and we'll take on board what you've sent and what you've told us. Thanks again. Okay, thank you. Good night, bye-bye. Good, our last for the day teleconference, Mr Kerry Layton. that we can push the trolley out with you. Oh, we can hear you. <laughs> 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 
Oh, your name is? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, whether it's... It could be our typo. Look, while we're on the call, uh, our clerk will work that out with you and then we'll catch up then. Yeah, we'll double check, but we'll make sure. Oh, it was called to four, which, which probably was the other one, because we were at 3.30, but that's fine if... The clerks work it out. We're happy to see you here. You've actually whistled that time back that we were delayed quite nicely. Yeah, because in fact the opposite can happen if you get too far ahead. You sit there waiting for the people to be ready. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're technically they're being blocked at no one's having individual time. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me, Audrey? Yeah, hello, Audrey. This is Dr Shane Reedy, Deputy Chair of the Health Select Committee. Round the table this afternoon, we have other MPs, Matt Ducey, Angie Warren-Clark and Dr Liz Craig. We have received your submission, so please take it as read. Thank you for sending it. And we're looking forward to hearing from you. We have roughly five minutes to hear what you'd like to tell us. So um, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Audrey Sharp. I'm an ex-university tax law teacher, a natural agriculture farmer living in North Auckland, a daughter, sister, mother and grandmother. I wrote my submission, which I think you have all read, because I passionately believe that greater reform is needed around cannabis availability and that the amendment being proposed to the misuse of drugs Act 1975 does not go far enough. While I support legislation making medical cannabis available for the terminally ill, there are thousands of others in this country suffering all kinds of health problems that could benefit from access to quality, affordable cannabis for medical use. As my submission states, I saw the benefit of a legally procured cannabis oil which was given in a one-drop dose daily to my 86-year-old mother for six months prior to her unexpected death. My only wish is that we had started giving her this oil years earlier for all the pain she was experiencing from her knee fall. Two broken hips, a broken back, pelvis, wrist and concussion from a head injury. Both my father and Nana, who each had cancer, would have benefited from medical cannabis to alleviate their pain and suffering, which we as a family witnessed first hand as they slowly died at home over several weeks. All the opiate drugs did for my father was give him hallucinations which meant that for his pain he refused to take larger doses. Rest homes are full of elderly who would benefit from cannabis oil. It would help them with their depression if they sometimes just wait to die, give them a better appetite so they could eat the food prepared for them instead of wasting it, help them put on weight which would increase their mobility and create calmness and peace within. My mother is an example. She started eating again, put on weight, her dementia reduced and her mobility increased so much she no longer needed her walker. This was just from one drop of cannabis oil given daily, not even the three grams medical cannabis prescribed for terminally ill in the UK. Why are people being turned into criminals when they are all they are trying to do is alleviate pain and suffering? There will be thousands of people right now in New Zealand who are breaking the law and yet who are normally not law breakers. I sat next to such a person recently at the doctor's with knee problems a National Party voter, but a user of illegally procured cannabis, which was helping him with his pain. He was older than my 62 years and quietly using this drug for his health problems. Over 17,000 people signed a petition presented to Parliament arguing for law reform. A UMR poll showed 76% support for a law change allowing doctors to prescribe cannabis and a 61% support for treating cannabis as a herbal remedy when used therapeutically. What is wrong with our lawmakers? Why are we taking such slow conservative steps in this area of law reform? The UN Convention on Narcotic Drugs allows nations to choose to allow the use of cannabis for medical and scientific purposes. It requires a licensing system for all cultivators, manufacturers and distributors. 
Many countries have allowed cannabis to be available for medical purposes, decriminalised and even legalised for personal use. The list is wide and varied. Canada, Chile, Colombia, Germany, Greece, Israel, Italy, the Netherlands, Poland, Peru, Uruguay, Macedonia, Romania, Croatia, Cyprus, Portugal, Finland, Czech Republic, and two days ago Zimbabwe. 29 states in the USA and even states within Australia. Why are we following the restrictive approach of the UK and France which allows only specific cannabinoids to be used for certain health conditions? Are we in the pockets of large food and pharmaceutical giants such as Bayer who have entered into exclusive marketing agreements for the GW Pharmaceuticals brand Sapific? The cost of the medical cannabis being prescribed is prohibitive for some people who urgently need access to medical cannabis and at a cost that is affordable. The plant is one of 50 fundamental herbs in traditional Chinese medicine used initially 10,000 years ago in Taiwan. From the 8th to the 18th centuries in the Islamic world, in ancient Greece and India, California legalised medical cannabis in 1996 and Canada in 2001. Has their world fallen apart? Here we are in 2018 and while we are looking finally at reform, it is restricted to the terminally ill. Under a licensing system for people to grow their own plants or through a pharmacy prescription, we could make this healing herb available to a much wider group of people who would benefit from its use, and not just the terminally ill. The availability of it will generate tax revenue for our cash-strapped health sector. For example, California could see a 643 million marijuana tax fall in its first full year of legislation, according to its Governor Jerry Brown. And here in New Zealand, Perhaps instead of grass deserts with farting animals creating ozone pollution, we could have an industry of cultivation not just for medical purposes, but for the production of the hemp plant as an alternative to plastic. Cannabis is safer than many pharmaceuticals that is, as it is a natural herb plant without the wide range of chemicals found in pharmaceuticals and their side effects. Painkillers can be severely addictive and mainstream medicine can cause gastric intestinal issues, allergic reactions, blindness, internal bleeding, organ failure, and even death from complications and overdose. With medical cannabis, patients can reap the benefits of managing these symptoms without fear of addiction, overdose, or serious side effects. As an educator for more than 40 years working in the tertiary sector and high schools with the unemployed, I believe New Zealand needs to take a lead and treat all drugs as a health issue instead of a legal one. Clearly the war on drugs view has proven an expensive waste of time as there are even more dangerous drugs everywhere. Look at the current tea epidemic in New Zealand right now. Then we can educate our young people on the truth about drugs and have their greatest success in prevention of dangerous drug use. This amendment is one step but it does not go far enough and maybe now it's time for our lawmakers to be bold and brave as we were when we gave women the vote and took an anti-nuclear stance in a Cold War world. Thank you. Audrey, thank you very much for your submission. We have in writing what you've told us. Uh, we have uh, reached our, uh, the time available, but thank you very much again. That's fine. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good submission. Uh, we'll turn it off into the audience, and uh, then we'll uh, speak with this lady over here, and then we'll be concluded for the day. Great. So teleconference, Neville Yates, this is a callback. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. We'll keep rolling. Kelly, hiya. Would you like to come up to the table? You've been very patient. Come on up and join us. Kelly, just remind us your surname, please. Patchett. 
spelled P A T C H E T T. Kelly K E L L Y. L L Y. Kelly, you've more than seen the format for House Select Committee Run. So uh, welcome to the table. You're our last of the day. Uh, the, the time is yours. Tell us what we need to know. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you for allowing me the time to speak my submission for cannabis. Um, my name's Kelly. I'm a mum. I'm a Kiwi. I'm also a cannabis user. I use cannabis because three years ago I got a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. Now before that I have, I've been diagnosed with autoimmune disease disorders before. So it's, you know, I didn't think much of it. I knew it was pain, like the doctor, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, they suspected to start off with, but although I do have that, um, I've been diagnosed with fibro as well. Fibro is more than just chronic pain. I was more than just nerves reacting the wrong way, telling your brain that it's feeling something that's not there. You know, fibro to me is waking every day like someone's beating me with a bat, but I have no marks. Uh, fibro is being so exhausted I can hardly move. I have two children. I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old, and I find it hard to move or do anything with them. I have a chest plate on my chest that restricts my breathing and I'm given opiates which inhibit your respiratory. Um, you know, fibro for me is this pain that shoots out my back and if I close my eyes I can see it. It's about the colour of your tie. It's like lightning and it wraps itself around my head and squeezes and that's when I know a flare up's going to happen. When that happens I don't go anywhere. I'm not capable of functioning. Fibro is life. This won't go away. It's not curable. I love this. I'm 40. I turned 40 in March. I was diagnosed three years ago. The other disorders I have are now becoming issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I have blood issues, which they can't seem to find out anything about. Um, so over Easter, I was fighting to stay alive in my house. Couldn't go to hospital. I was immune compromised. Couldn't be at home because if my O2 dropped, because my hemoglobin in my white blood cells, my platelets were so low, if I stood up I could have fainted and had a heart attack on the spot. But, you know, that, that, that's my life. So I use cannabis. Now, for a year and a half I used prescription drugs they gave me. I took everything my doctor gave me. I listened, I read up on it. I'm not stupid. I have a child that was from a NICU. So I know medical jargon. I'm not a stupid person. I was on 800 milligrams of tramadol a day, 80 milligrams plus of codeine, 5,000 milligrams plus of Panadol, 3,600 milligrams of gabapentin a day, 20 to 40 milligrams of Zopcone sleeping tablets, that's two of them, 30 milligrams of Norfress antidepressant. That was all I was allowed before I went into cere cerebral seizures because of the opiates in my system. 6 milligrams of diclofenac, that's all my body could tolerate, and nortriptyline to balance me out. So that was over 30 tablets a day I swallowed, and I was meant to take them with food so that they don't burn out my digestive system. You can't take 30 tablets of, with food. <laughs> it, opiates have a point. They work for, for what they were intended upon, not chronic use, not long-term use. Okay, three years, a year and a half was hell. I went to my doctor in December of 2016 and I said to him, and you have his written <laughs> letter at the back of my submission. He states, I went into there, I was not of sound mind. I know that. I was, I went in there saying to him, I needed an alternative. I didn't want the pain clinic. I didn't want methadone, I didn't want Oxycontin, I didn't want stronger medication, I wanted something that gave me my life back. And he went like that, he couldn't do anything. So I gave him three months, I said I'll come back in three months time, I'll take my script and I'll come back in three months time, you find me something and I'll look. And I went back to him and he was beside himself because he knew, he knew I was going to take my life. I was beyond it. I just said to him, you either find me something or that's it. I will deal to it. 
I walked in there and he was beside himself. He said he couldn't do anything. He said he put through the referral to the pain clinic. He explained again the medication, which I declined because I have little kids in my house. My daughter gets OxyContin, she's dead. So I said no. I turned around and I said, I would like you to remove half my gabapentin. I'd like you to drop the diclofenac and the naltriptyline, half my norpress, take down my tramadol, remove half of my paracode. And he asked me why. And I smiled and I said I was eating cannabis. He shrugged and laughed a little, but he said, okay, let's see how this goes. If you feel that you can do this, I said, I already have. I'm not using the other pills. This is all I need to get through until I can drop further. I took it upon myself with the guidance of my doctor. He never once guided me into it, but he always stood by me. We do monthly blood results because I have to anyway. So he gets to monitor my levels. He looks at me every three months. The only time he got concerned was November when I walked in and I asked for a script of opioids. And he asked me why. And I said, because all our fucking theories have been targeted and we have no cannabis. And he was angry. But he gave me my script and I walked away and I said, but I'll address again, don't worry. It'll happen. And I walked away and I did that. I am now proud to say that at the moment I'm taking currently 200 milligrams of tramadol and 60 milligrams of codeine daily if I have to for my stomach issues that are causing my blood issues and we don't know. Medicinal cannabis, or the cannabis I should say, because this whole CBD, THC, excuse my language, but is really that. CBD is great, works on my inflammatory, awesome, arthritis, great. My shoulder, that constantly pops out all by itself, easy. Pop it back and rub some balm on it. But I want to hit the pain I need, THC. It is as effective as giving me a Panadol, literally. I'm not being theatrical. The thing with plant is it's whole plant we need to consider. I hear constantly, sitting in here today, the wonderful doctors, the people who for, people against, people who knew stuff, people who didn't know stuff but sort of chucked their point of view in anyway, tried to be helpful. The thing is, whole plant is the best. As soon as you start cutting things apart and dividing them down to their base compounds, you come into problems, you come into synthetic cannabis. Where the hell do you think it arrived from? It was derived because they were trying to find a synthetic version of THC. Sativex, CBD and THC. What about the THCV? Now, I don't know if you know about THCV, but it's at a higher point than CBD and THC have found. It also helps with obesity. It helps with... Um, it helps with so many different things like the fact that that is, tends to be why you become sedated more. If you take your decarb further, that product will be more sedating. It allows for sleep. You can prevent that from happening by choosing a strain. It's education we need, not just the people. Everyone needs, the doctors especially. We need to catch up. We need to stop worrying about what the last hundred years talked about this plant and just look at it as exactly as it is, a plant full of compounds that can help people. It's an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, pain reliever. Dandelion has cannabinoids. Kawakawa has cannabinoids. I make a balm out of kawakawa and dandelion and calendula and it's brilliant and it's beautiful and it's full of cannabinoids. It works on our endocannabinoid system. It doesn't touch our respiratory system. You can not overdose. Yeah, it, you will need to wrap it up. I'm sorry. I, no, I no, totally no, want we, we to. Sense, we <laughs> see so, your passion. Okay. If, there's a, if there's a summary wrap, you go for it. I guess my final, my final thing I need to say is, in my submission, I wrote, if you were put in my position, okay, you were given those, that life service of hell. Your child, your mother, your father, a very, your partner. You know, you have to see this every day and think about it. It's a lot easier to be in it than to be the person standing next to the person. Mm. 
If you had to do that, would you allow people who perhaps have no experience with chronic pain, no experience with loss, um, cancer, my mother had breast cancer, you know, those sorts of things. If you were put in that position and someone said, no, you cannot use that dandelion to treat your child's epilepsy, even though it will stop the diazepam and it will stop all of the other things because we have put it into law and we choose not to educate ourselves. That's all we're asking. Educate yourselves. Do it properly. Listen to the facts, not what people are spouting. Read the data. Look at Israel. Israel is amazing. They have got some amazing stuff. That guy who said before, nobody smokes cannabis to cure, cure lung disease. Guess what they're doing in Israel? And guess what? It gets the cannabinoids straight to the damaged organs, to the damaged part, and they're finding amazing things. So please, just do your research. Educate yourselves. So Kelly, I'm really pleased that uh, you came across to our committee because you've been the great summary uh, of the day. Lucky us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm a waffler. <laughs> no. it, it was good waffle. Uh, and, and you've really summarised nicely uh, parts of what we've heard today. And we, we have your submission. Uh, we've heard the points that are relevant to you. Thank you very much for joining us and informing us. And we're more informed than we were 10 minutes ago. So thank you very much. Thank and that's fine. And uh, just on the side point, is I'm um, Black market home that people seem to be so worried about, medicinal users, they're already growing it. They're already looking after themselves. If you take that away, what do you, what's going to happen to those people? You know, a moratorium, something. Just think about it, please. Because you take this away from the people, it's You've already got so much to do with poverty and everything else. You don't need this to deal with it. It's an easy decision, really. Understood. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Well, actually, uh... <laughs> we just run it past the group. So uh, we've got a request uh, from next door to take some more teleconferences. Uh, we up for that or not? Yeah. Basically, uh, four. Uh, I, I think I heard you concept. If you need to leave, we'll still be core eight, so that'll be fine. I, I don't need to leave until I can at least stay till 4.30, and then I've got 4.45, I've got another, I'm subbing in on that. I'm thinking by 4.15, uh, we need to wrap this up. It's going to be a long day, and we're going to be turning off if we don't want to be. Yep. So I'm coming up with the this four, okay, we'll come into that four and then we are done. Okay, and some of them are a couple of callbacks and, and so on. So, Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that would take us to ten past if we sort of roughly on schedule, if that's all right. Yeah, okay. Things are not open. No, they won't be. They're crossovers from next door. <clears throat> Next door. Okay, I'll make sure I take that. I'll be on the thumb drive, won't they? Uh, they're not on the thumb drive that I can see, but it could be just the time, and I've not been able to hunt, hunt them down. What time was Kinsey Tony? Not on us. See, these are coming from the other committee. So even on the thumb drive, it's not. I'm not sure. Oh well, if we have, then we'll see it on their um, on their list. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Kingsley. This is Dr. Shane Reddy speaking, Deputy Chair of the Health Select Committee. Around the table this afternoon, we have MPs uh, Matt Ducey, uh, Angie Warren-Clark, and Dr. Liz Craig. 
we have your submission in electronic format, so we will have that available to us. But this is an opportunity for you to speak to us for the next five minutes or so and, uh, and, and tell us what you'd like to tell us. So welcome and please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I've been organic in uh, business in the past, so I believe in natural and organic methods. Uh, I've been focusing on uh, medicinal answers in that vein, and I see cannabis has what I'm surprised at as many benefits, uh, not just one or two illnesses. It seems to be a, a quite a huge benefit. Um, not just the medicinal side of it, but uh, in seed oil, powder and milk seem like they could play a good part in their future. And I'm hoping that um, this bill widens up the view to, uh, to not only medicinal use, but uh, a wider perspective. Um, it's, a, it's a simple plant that we can grow, and it grows organically. So. One of the main things I'm concerned about is that there might be a bit too much influence from profit-driven directors. And uh, I respect the fact there are two doctors listening to me, but some of what I might say is going to be um, potentially uh, disruptive. The, the medical system itself is conditioned to follow a lot of procedures. And, um, it was set up many years ago by people that were backing the pharmaceutical industry and they provided a lot of research funding and funding for hospitals in general but only along the lines of pharmaceutical drugs. And uh, I can understand the profit motives of what they were doing but we haven't actually changed that position since the late 30s. It's dictated the uh, structure of both the medical system and uh, the way doctors are trained. So somebody like me that's uh, walked out in the left field and been organic, it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not following the plot. And um, to say this in a medical field is quite difficult because we've all been conditioned to follow what we've been allowed to have from the uh, the doctor's surgery, and they've been they've been educated without nutrition and without holistic medicine at all. And if we go back in history, we can see prior to the late thirties that uh, both of those things were a, a very active part of our health. So funding for alternative medicine is, is probably a big ask. Um, if you go to you go to request health care these days, you're either getting a drug or you're not allowed anything. And to ask for funding for, especially when you use the word organic, but just natural things. And cannabis is a, is a basic plant. You know, in this instance, we're looking at something that will grow and take down. We're not looking at something bizarre, dangerous, or, um, you know, otherwise manufactured. And this, the... The unfortunate reality of finance is that most research into medical options has been based on the potential for profit. And when you do research on a plan that anyone can grow, you're not facing a profit. So it's, uh, it hasn't happened for obvious reasons. And one of the things I'd like to suggest that you look at either now or in the future is the possibility that the government could be involved in research of medical answers. Um, at the moment, pharmaceutical companies are the only ones doing the research and they're only researching something that they can use. And the government takes, well I'm referring to government, I guess the American one at the beginning, the government takes what's offered in terms of their trial. If our government would take a step and say that there are some possible organic answers, could we organise research in that direction? It's not going to make a huge profit for the government, but what it will do is it will reduce the cost of the health care. So the health department funding could go down because there are cheaper options. So it does have a reason to do it, a benefit, and 
we may find ourselves with a more affordable health system. Now, if that, if that finds a home somewhere in the uh, parliament, I'd honestly be surprised because there's a lot of people conditioned to think the way we've been brought up and to follow the plot. So I'm not holding my breath, but it's an option that could be put by somebody and perhaps a few examples like cannabis to prove the point. Um, I get the word anecdotal evidence used a lot, which annoys me. It, it puts down the fact that somebody's actually cured themselves with something. Now, if somebody cures themselves with a, with a basic plant, it's not to be rubbish. There's a few other people that may benefit as well. And I don't care if only 30% of the people benefit from it. I'd like to see if I'm one of them. But I'm not offered that opportunity because the idea is rubbish. And I turn around and watch the success rate of chemotherapy, which we're conditioned to have. And that's atrocious. Get it approved and it's used and it's back. So, you know, I'm asking, I'm asking for something difficult. I do understand that. But because I've used organic methods and they have worked, I have faith in the fact that the same thing will apply to the medical world. And, um, you know, you rock a boat like this, no, you don't get a lot of support, and the only way I can wake someone up to the idea is in a position like this, maybe to, to float the idea and see if somebody understands. Kingsley, uh, thank you for, for, for what you're telling us. We've actually used the time available, and I think maybe you were drawing to a conclusion anyway. But uh, we have taken on board what you've uh, told us, and uh, we have your submission available to us, and we'll certainly uh, draw all of them together. Thank you very much anyway. Good on you. Thank you, Kingsley. Thank you. Bye. Good afternoon, Adam. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Adam. This is Dr. Shane Reddy, uh, Deputy Chair of the Health Select Committee. Around the table this afternoon, we have MPs Matt Ducey, Angie Warren-Clark, and Dr. Liz Craig. We have access uh, to your submission, but we're looking forward to hearing from you. We have roughly five minutes for your submission, and the time is yours. So please go ahead. Um, and of 
the few things muscle resistance and anti inflammatory uh, doesn't mean I can get very much done. Um, of course, and I don't work. When I did take uh, cannabis in Australia, uh, I used it for medical reasons. Um, I was working up to 37.5 hours a week since I came to back to New Zealand and stopped using it. Didn't use that. I haven't worked a day since. Uh, it's actually quite depressing not being up to work, um, but hopefully you have some insight to that and talk to people who have disabilities and don't work. Um, but no one will hire you because you're up and down with your health, so it's all over the place. Um, with cannabis, yes, you can't do things, and of course, you shouldn't drive. I mean, that's a given. Hopefully that's a given. But how many people in Auckland at the moment are driving around on vacation that is already with base? I mean, I'm pretty sure I've seen many whilst walking around the city. And that's quite frightening in itself. Um, these are all things you've got to look at. I mean, the relationship between taking a drug, um, which is prescribed, which is useful, but people being responsible for those drugs that they're taking as well. I mean, and I think with cannabis, you have actually have a real chance, particularly medical team of cannabis, to talk about those responsibilities when you're taking medication and what you're supposed to do as a person who's taking medication. So, don't operate heavy machinery, um, don't have a job where you actually have to make sense. And, I don't know, I'm just, yeah, I would just like to be able to take it and have a life back. I suppose it's a problem on a personal level. Um, personal level, we need something when people are getting chronic, these chronic conditions, which is not invasive and it's not as dangerous as the opioids. Um, I was reading over the weekend a young man died last year in November from an overdose of what's that terrible word you were spraying him out. Uh, the one that's a hundred times stronger than the phenotype. He was taking that and he died. Look, there are no cases of people today dying from cannabis, but like but there is a problem of mixing cannabis with other drugs, which is another thing. We have an opportunity to start talking about how drugs interact, how our medications interact. We hardly ever hear about what alcohol and medications for the pharmacy do. We should. And I think cannabis opens up that door completely because we don't want to mix alcohol and cannabis. It's a really bad combination and we don't want to see it. Um, well, I know I don't, but I do want to see cannabis as you. A, save money for a health system that is in trouble. And B, to hopefully generate money for you guys so you can actually run the health system effectively. And I suppose that's the basic of my argument. Just do it because it's cheaper and it'll make it all healthier to some extent. But I'm aware there are pitfalls, but we have this opportunity to talk about it. And I think we should take this opportunity. The more we treat cannabis like some evil that everyone's scared of, it means we don't talk about these other drugs either. And we should we should really be getting into this discussion. It should be way more open and way more transparent. Thank you for your time. I think that's five minutes. And have a great day. Adam, thank you for your time. A very clear presentation. Thanks indeed.
you have to go to the house and the boss is coming or not? No, that's the new one. Um, yeah. Let me look at the page on the first sentence. Then they will do a very brief debrief of self. They are only advise you the shopping comments they can but they are otherwise in control. Five minutes after you finish the debrief. You officials with the ministry? Yeah. Oh, good on you. Good on you. Persisted through most of the day? Yeah, you've had a long day. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a stretch. Yeah, quite powerful stories, huh? Yeah. And not. Um, yeah, I'm a bit flippant here, but you know, not, not that many fringe. Loopies, you know, just actually very normal people who all of a sudden had to make a decision about engaging in a certain behaviour. It's fascinating. I hadn't thought about it too much. Yeah. Yeah, it's very easy to paint the pictures of the, <laughs> the, the pro cannabis movement, isn't it? But get some people here and just. Yeah, yeah, the kids' stuff was very powerful. And given the time to appreciate the people. Yeah, indeed. Interesting right. comment, uh, something that's easy to be in it than observing it. Yeah. It's quite interesting. Yeah, because we're yeah. all different yeah. 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 No blood test to identify it. Yeah, da, da. Right. A whole series of symptoms that actually would amount to like exclusion. Else. Eliminate everything else. No, it must be fibromyalgia. Yeah. It's bio slash viral slash papillary flu, whatever you sort of want to yeah. break it into. Chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic candidiasis, multitude of names. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Uh, look what we'll do. We will clear the room then apart from officials. Thank you for joining us today. Well done. You hope it's been interesting and useful. It has for us.